April 7, 1967. The Time magazine comes out with a very unusual cover. It used to feature a portrait, but this week it was a bright collage. Dozens of colorful pills shaped like the Venus symbol. The headline read, The Pill. The issue's main topic was birth control pills, which 10 years prior, in 1957, had successfully entered the market. The main article focused not so much on the medical aspect of the topic, but the societal change brought by the wonder pill. It was the first medication prescribed for people with no health issues. And then it was the pill that liberated women in the 1960s and became one of the main drivers of the sexual revolution. The other of the article was also hoping that people would start using the pill and save the planet from the menacing overpopulation crisis. The cost of this revolutionary pill was only 11 cents per pill. Two bucks a month, the cost of four Mac hamburgers. When the issue came out, 13 million women in the world were already using the pill. All of them, as well as the pharmaceutical companies that were welcoming the new lucrative market, owed it to Gregory Pincus, a biologist. He is the one who is credited with the invention of oral contraceptives. Ironically, at the start of his career, Pincus was going in the opposite direction. He was working on the IVF, in vitro fertilization technology. His effort was focused on helping those women who, on the contrary, couldn't get pregnant. So, how did such a U-turn happen? Hi, and welcome to Control Shift, a podcast by Libo Libo Studio and Humble Team. My name is Anatoly Gromov, I'm a design manager and a product designer. The nature of the work that we designers do is many things beyond Figma artboards. Companies like Humble Team more often than not help entrepreneurs and businesses to basically reinvent their wheels. So we know firsthand what it means to be stuck and what it takes to overcome it. The key element, we think, is the ability to shift focus, goals, approach, perspective. Our podcast is a selection of stories like that about professionals from different spheres, their shifts, and most importantly, the difference they make in the world. In this episode, I'll tell you the story that at first glance is as far from the world of startups as it can possibly be. It's the story of a scientist who invented oral contraceptives. But you'll see that his adventurism and readiness to change were the kind that many entrepreneurs would have envied. Thanks to them, he made an exemplary U-turn and changed millions of lives. In 1932, an English writer, Aldous Huxley, published a dystopian novel called Brave New World. Action takes place in 26th century London. Let's quickly recall the novel setting. People of the future no longer give birth like we do. Humans are conceived through a procedure of carefully selecting and then fertilizing eggs in a test tube. Embryos stay until their birth in an artificial womb in a special facility called the Hatchery. This dystopian image was a reflection of the Western society's angst and fear caused by the advance of the new technologies. He was happily given interviews and promising the reporters the dawn of the new world, where not only rabbits will replicate via a test tube, but people as well. However, Pinkus's findings, like Huxley's book, caused more anxiety than hope. Some papers compared Pincus to Victor Frankenstein, the fictitious professor who was trying to solve the mystery of birth and accidentally created a monster 
in the process. Pincus' reputation became toxic. His co-workers from Harvard, who at first were closely following his research, were now turning away from him. Soon, he was let go from the university. He was considered too toxic as an employee. But Pincus was not the one who would give up easily. Gregory Pincus was born in 1903 in New Jersey to Polish Jewish immigrants. While growing up, he was described as curious, energetic, and a very ambitious and stubborn young man. Pincus's biggest passion was discovering something new in life. He received his bachelor's degree at Cornell University, his master's at Harvard, and then he stayed there to teach zoology. He was particularly interested in endocrinology, this new promising area of scientific knowledge combining biology and medicine. By that time, scientists found out four main hormones that took part in the reproduction process in mammals. What they didn't know was how exactly these hormones worked. Pincus has set his mind on finding this out, a perfect goal for an ambitious young scholar like him. Endocrinology and fertility in mammals were a medical blue ocean. So Pincus was not in the least discouraged when he was fired from Harvard. He moved to Worcester, a small town in Massachusetts. The local university was the only place that would hire the notorious biologist. His lab, though, was placed in a dusty basement near a coal storage, and he had to spend most of his working time cleaning the black dust off the test tubes. Eventually, Pincus decided to radically change his approach. No doubt this was not the place to make great discoveries. So he started his own research facility together with his colleague Hudson Hoagland. They called it the Worcester Foundation for Experimental Biology. The co-founders bought a small house and turned the nearby garage into a lab. They continued dissecting rabbits and lab rats in their own innovative garage-turned-lab facility. The lab was crowdfunded by the Massachusetts locals who donated their money to support science. They were feeling very proud of Worcester, the small town but the big industrial center, so helping the local research initiative was a form of patriotism. And the recent boost in the pharmaceutical industry also helped. The pharma companies were providing researchers like Pincus with the chemicals they needed to run lab tests. It's kind of like an investment strategy, a diversified portfolio. You invest in numerous little projects hoping that one of them takes off and brings you millions. And clearly, hormones were on the potentially profitable list. So, Pincus was the scholar in exile, but things were slowly getting better for him. And then one day, 13 years after he'd been fired from Harvard, he gets invited to a posh business lunch. An unknown woman of a respectable age approaches him. This is an all-American celebrity, a feminist, and a civil rights activist, Margaret Sanger. She had been planning to meet with Pincus for a long time. What events, what emotions in your life made Margaret Sanger a crusader for birth control? Well, Mr. Wallace, it's hard to say that any one thing has made one do this or that. I think from the very beginning, uh, I came of a large family. My mother died young, 11 children. That made an impression on me as a child. Mm -hmm. I was a trained nurse, went among the people. I saw women who asked to have some means whereby they wouldn't have to have another pregnancy. So there's a number of things that are one after the other that really made you feel that you had to do something. This is an excerpt from her interview with the legendary American journalist Mike Wallace. Margaret Sanger recalls the time when she used to work as a nurse and later founded the first birth control clinic in the United States. It was a place where poor and underprivileged women could get condoms or cervical cap, another contraceptive available at the time. The clinic would develop into a franchise and eventually Sanger will had a big NGO called Planned Parenthood of America. Here's the thing. World War II was followed by an economic boom that was followed by a baby boom. 
By that time, the world population had already grown twofold since the beginning of the century, spiking from 1.5 billion to 3 billion people. Sociologists and demographers were publishing numerous articles on how the world would soon lack food and a brutal fight for basic resources would start, which in our nuclear age meant total annihilation and the end of humankind. <laughs> and not just the wise important men saw the need for a new type of contraception. Women were eager for it too. Consecutive pregnancies were very hard on their bodies and contraception was mostly unaffordable. Yeah, you could go and buy condoms at the store, but many husbands simply refused to use them. And then there was another thing. Up to 1972, in most of the US states, the so-called Comstock laws were still in effect. They effectively prohibited the distribution of any sex ad materials, along with adult fiction and pornographic images. This legislation was the reason why Margaret Sanger ended up in prison eight times. Sanger was flooded with letters from women with many children who were asking for help they could not get. She was also shocked with how many women were dying as a result of black alley or DIY medical abortions. She wanted to give those women a simple, effective and affordable solution. A solution that a woman could use unbeknownst to a man. Like a pill. So in 1950 she comes up to the notorious Gregory Pincus, the best scholar specializing in fertility in mammals. Do you think you could make that pill? She asked him the moment they first met. Pincus took some time to think. Technically, he was studying the fertilization process this whole time. Only now, the objective was not to study and learn how to facilitate conception, but to prevent it. And he actually had an idea about how this could be done. So he responded to Sanger with a yes and asked for a modest investment of $3,000. I only have $2,000, she wrote to him in a couple of weeks. That'll work, he responded. As you can see, Pincus was not driven by money. He was driven by sheer excitement in the first place. And of course, he was an ambitious scholar who was flattered by the perspective of making a world-changing discovery. He was very close to it in 1937 when he performed the first IVF on a rabbit, but then forced to step back. And now, maybe for the first time since 1937, he could work on something equally big and possibly become famous one day. But how can one shift goals like that and just start doing the exact opposite to what he was doing his whole career? In truth, the hard part was to decide on making such a U-turn. Pincus already had all the knowledge and instruments that he needed to succeed. Back in 1937, when he still worked at Harvard, he read an academic article stating that ovulation, maturation of eggs, in rabbits was inhibited by progesterone. But there were no more conclusions outside of it. Remember we mentioned that Pincus had an idea. This was his idea. To use progesterone. Okay, now an extra quick Conception 1-on-1 -on -one intro. For the conception to happen, a mature egg has to leave the ovary and then travel through the fallopian tube where it meets the spermatozoon. Then the committees merge and a fertilized egg moves down into the uterus and sticks to its endometrium. The pregnancy has begun. But in order to avoid multiple pregnancies, the ovaries need to stop producing eggs, and for that they need to receive a clear signal saying, enough, that's what progesterone, among its other functions, is responsible for. Let's repeat, progesterone puts ovaries, meaning the ability to get pregnant, on hold. But what happens if a woman who is not pregnant ingests progesterone? Pincus recreated the experiment he had read about in the article. He proved it right. The rabbits on progesterone did not get pregnant. And most importantly, they did not die, which meant it was potentially safe to use. The next step would be running tests on women and finding out how progesterone affects them. But how to find volunteers? Pincus turned to medics for support. He decided to collaborate with another gynecologist, who just as Pincus initially tried to help women get pregnant. His name was John Rock. 
Another thing. Rock was already prescribing progesterone to some of his patients, but in order to get pregnant. It might appear odd, but some women were actually getting pregnant after taking progesterone and then dropping it. Rock called it the rollback effect, or the reset. Meanwhile, not all Rock's patients wanted to become mothers. It was when Rock started to think about birth control medication that Pincus contacted him, suggesting they work together. Rock has given Pincus access to his patients. Sadly, Sanger's grant money was gone. But another feminist investor appeared, Catherine McCormick. An activist, Mrs. Sanger's friend and, most importantly, a millionaire's widow. She was the one who basically sponsored the pill. So Pincus didn't have to worry about finding money anymore. He could afford all the rabbits and chemicals he wanted. He could also afford to hire assistants and fully focus on the research. At the moment, his primal goal was to establish the effective and safe dosage of progesterone and to make sure there were no delayed side effects. Under Pincus's request, John Rock began giving progesterone to a 70 of his patients and also to nurses at his clinic. Under the Comstock laws, he could not really tell women that he was studying the methods of contraception. So on the record, he promised them the opposite, to find a cure for infertility. Very important notice. Back when Pincus and Rock were conducting their research, the medical ethics used to be very different. First of all, both scientists and medics were actively conducting experiments on humans. Secondly, most of the people that participated in the studies were uninformed of possible side effects, and the researchers saw no problem in it. Namely, many of Rock's patients who took progesterone reported nausea, headaches, and breast pain. They also complained of frequent mood swings. Notwithstanding that almost half of the women were experiencing severe side effects and quit before the end of the trial, some important findings were brought about. Despite all side effects, progesterone was not fatally harmful, and it was definitely more safe than a black alley abortion. To refine the chemical composition of the pill, Pincus needed more volunteers to participate in the trial, and once again he had no idea how to find them. Placing an ad in a paper was unthinkable, mind the Comstock laws. Counting on the word of mouth was hardly an option. Walls have ears. That's when he decided to seek women outside of the US. He needed to find a country with an overpopulation problem, but without a legislation as restrictive as the American law. Puerto Rico, a US satellite, seemed like a good choice. It also lived through a post-war baby boom and had millions of families suffering from poverty. And this is another thing that looks ambiguous from a modern perspective. Well, there were um, clinics set up um, throughout the island, mostly around San Juan. Um. This is Jonathan Eig, an author of the book Birth of the Pill. He's being interviewed for a podcast called Hormonal. And they would advertise in the newspapers, they would tell people word of mouth that um, this new form of birth control was, was being offered. And um, it was interesting because it was, of course... Um, in violation of the of the Catholic Church's doctrines, and the, the the priests on Sunday would warn women. You know, we've heard that there are these experiments going on. We want to remind you that uh, birth control is a sin, and um, that would only increase the demand. There'd be bigger lines on Monday morning uh, outside these clinics. Puerto Rican women volunteered blindly. They did not even know for sure whether these obscure pills were meant to prevent pregnancies. And of course, nobody told them about potential side effects of new meds. Later, the scientists would find them to be quite severe, all cause the subjects were given a dosage way too high. The levels were much too high. They were probably, you know, five or ten times higher than they needed to be in the beginning. And that was just a part of the process of experimentation. And the men uh, who were running these experiments were biased because they were men, they were not experiencing the side effects. 
they felt like whatever side effects the women had to endure, it was worth it. Some of the nurses, some of the doctors who were in the clinics complained to Pincus and said, you know, you've got to stop. Uh, this is this mm. is wrong. And again, partly because they're men, partly because they're doctors, um, they viewed this as um, you know, a sacrifice worth making, that this was um, they were looking at the big picture, and they believed that they were they would be judged on the right side of history. I feel the same way about this that I feel about American slavery. So much of our comfort today was built on the suffering of others. And the same is true for the birth control pill. It changed women's lives. It freed women. It allowed women opportunities that they never would have had before. Um, college, jobs, families, sex, so much came from the pill, and it came because people suffered for it, that that women, um, black and brown women in particular, were treated like second-class citizens. And, um, you know, you, you just, that's a sad part of the world. After a few years of experiments conducted in Puerto Rico, a medication called Enovid, the first oral contraceptive, entered the U.S. market. Within the first two years, more than 1.2 million women started using the pill. Most of them would later experience severe side effects because of too high recommended dosage. But at first, excitement prevailed. Pincus lived through his second round of public recognition. But a scandal happened, again. The thing is, the artificial hormones he had to use in the trials were produced by a farm company called GD Searle. Of course, it dominated the market of oral contraceptives as a monopolist, while other companies were trying to catch up. By the mid-1960s, the company's net profit from Inovid amounted to $24 million, which was an enormous success. And, surprise surprise, Pincus was one of the company's shareholders. That's where the most of the criticism from both his contemporaries and historians comes from. It reads as if Pincus was interested in getting the drug to the market as quickly as possible. Was this incentive to rush the production a reason why the recommended dosage was way too high, even dangerous? Why Pincus didn't thoroughly study other options? We don't know this for a fact. There is no direct proof of Pincus's malice. So, Gregory Pincus could have become the inventor of IVF, but he became known as the one who invented the birth control pill. And the first human IVF was first conducted by physiologist Robert Edwards and gynecologist Patrick Steptoe. This happened in 1978, 20 years since oral contraceptives were invented. By the way, Edwards and Steptoe's work was built on the progesterone research conducted by Pincus. So you could say he was a part of both inventing contraceptives and IVF. Two diametrically opposite inventions that changed the world. What drew my attention to this story is how easily Gregory Pincus shifted when encountering resistance. Kicked out of Harvard? Boom, not a problem. Let's move to another university. New place sucks and makes it impossible to do the job properly? Okay. Let's crowdfund and move to a garage in a true startup manner. It seems like Pincus has never let himself to be too attached. Something does not work? Okay, thank you, next. But at the same time, he did not throw away everything he had been working on for years. When he met Margaret Sanger and made the most important shift, the U-turn in his goals, he got his balance between change and continuity perfectly. Every other story of a good pivot has the same aspect. You take your best asset, your team or technology or unique expertise, and you move to a more promising market where this asset can be applied better. In Pinkus' case, it was decades of accumulated knowledge of reproduction and hormones. But before we say our goodbyes, let's go back to the 1960s for a minute. Back to the time when millions of women received the chance to be in charge of their own body. 
One of the women to whom the magic pill was prescribed was Doris Wagner, a homemaker from Illinois. It's funny, but there is not a mini pivot of sorts. In 1961, Doris and her husband David had their fourth child. They decided that was it. Doris began taking an of it, and she soon faced a practical problem. The pills were sold in a big glass bottle and had to be taken starting from the fifth day of the menstrual cycle. Exactly one pill a day for 20 days in a row. And then again a five-day break. The schedule required a good amount of focus and patience. Doris was always forgetting whether she had already taken the pill, and it was the time to take a break. She and David started having fights over it. So, after yet another row with his wife, David took a piece of paper and drew a calendar on it. Then he assigned a pill to each day. He would later say in interviews, this did wonders for our relationship. The calendar scheme was very simple and easy to use. But then an accident happened, one that could easily be predicted in a house full of kids. Someone dropped the piece of paper and the pills were scattered all over the floor. David began to think of a new solution. He found a clear sheet of plastic, tore a snap fastener off a child's toy, drilled a couple of holes and used some double-faced duct tape. The result was that would later be known as Dial Pack, a circular pill dispenser reminding of all telephones, of a frisbee or of a compact. Each pill aligned with a certain day. The new packaging proved to be very user-friendly and in a couple of months David Wagner applied for a patent. He also went to GD Searle, the Innovid manufacturer we talked about a couple of minutes before. He presented the packaging to the Searle marketing people, but no one there liked his pitch. David was a goal-driven man. He took his prototype to Ortho Pharmaceutical, another farm company that was trying to develop its own contraceptives. He was turned away again. And boy was he surprised when he recognized his compact prototype in the 1963 packaging of contraceptives sold by Ortho. It took him a year to obtain the patent. He also settled with Ortho, which agreed to pay him $10,000 so that he would not go to court. In the same manner, he received another $120,000 from other pharmaceutical companies that started selling pills and dial packs. Not bad for a blue-collar worker, huh? The practical packaging was great from a marketing standpoint, and it is still considered as one of the best examples of industrial design. By the way, there was an episode of 99 Invisible podcast devoted to Dial Pack. We highly recommend you to listen to it. You can find the link in the episode's description. But more importantly, we recommend you to continue to listen to our podcast. We've got a bunch of killer stories on the way. Control Shift was brought to you by Libo Libo Studio and Humble Team. And I'm your host, Anatoly Gromov. See you in the next one.